Hello and welcome to the Osasuna Real Madrid postgame podcast. We went to El Sadar, one of the tougher places to play, and came out with a 4-2 victory. I'm your host, Kian Sabani, joined today by Lucas Navarrete. Seconds after the final whistle, we are live on YouTube. What a fun game, Lucas. I think that was the most fun performance we had since the Girona game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an entertaining game for sure with all uh, those uh, three early goals. Then, you know, the game being open, Real Madrid having some chances here and there, obviously, then some quality goals by the end of it as well. So, yeah, it was an entertaining game for sure. Fede Valverde with a hat trick of assists. Yep. He was fantastic. I mean, I think everyone was pretty good today. Vinny was transcendent. And, yep. um, oh man, what an ending. I'm just going to say it right now, Lucas. I'm giving Arda Guler that goal. I think that <laughs> that is an Arda Guler goal. I don't care what the stats say. I don't care what the numbers say. When I look at the performances at the end of the season, I'm looking at all the numbers. Arda Guler, I'm putting an asterisk right now. Goal. That's a goal right there. Deserved goal. It's it's hard to think of like a player that in such a short amount of time has had so many impactful moments. Like he he plays like minutes at the end. Scores the goal, hits the crossbar. I think there was another. There was another one recently where he came off the bench late and almost scored. I think. Can't remember which one that was. Uh, and then, of course, we're just blessed with uh, these training clips every day of Goulart doing some some magical stuff in the scrimmage. Where do you want to start with this one, Lucas? Maybe the, the 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 Vinicius performance. I think he carried the team. I think he played uh, phenomenal football. His finishing was on point. Oh, very close to a hat trick as well. So yeah, very good performance from Vinicius. Unlucky to see that yellow card, which will prevent him from from participating in the next game against Bilbao. So it'll be a while. It actually be uh, his next game for Real Madrid will be on that first leg of the Champions League quarterfinals against Manchester City. So hopefully he doesn't lose much momentum momentum and much uh, not confidence but you know groove and momentum uh, by missing yeah almost a full calendar month of action because of that uh, yellow card because of obviously now we're entering a FIFA break and then Real Madrid will play on March uh, 31st against Athletic and then the next game after that will be the the, the the first leg of the quarterfinals against City so hopefully that yellow card again another silly yellow card I thought uh, but um, hopefully that doesn't ma matter much in terms of obviously Real Madrid's game against Bilbao, but also his own performance against uh, Manchester City. Can I hit you with conspiracy? Mm -hmm. I'm the least conspiracy. I'm like the most non-conspiracy theorist guy ever. Like I, I don't really subscribe to almost any conspiracy theory at all. Uh, or maybe it's more of like a blessing. I don't know what it is, but I, it's just something that I thought of when he got the yellow and he misses the athletic game. The blessing mm -hmm. is this. I know everyone's annoyed that he got the yellow for descent. And I kind of, I, I, I half joked before uh, when we, in, in the last podcast, when we drew Manchester City in the live reaction, I said, look, if he's going to get a yellow in the first leg against City and misses the second leg, it's going to come down to descent. Like I, I'm not worried about him doing Absolutely, a, a yeah. bone crunching slide tackle to someone's knee. I'm worried about two players getting a yellow specifically. One, Vinny for descent or and or Kamavinga, a yellow for a clean challenge. <laughs> they both got yellows today, ironically. Yeah, but here's the blessing. Uh, Kamavinga Vinny, was close to a red card, by the way, but yeah. He, he did. He, it's, he's Kamavinga. He has like a bunch of these amazing <laughs> tackles and then he'll have one or two that are late. But the blessing is this. He misses Athletic and not Classico. Sure. And he also gets a game rest just in case before the city game, which is, I think that it's three days apart. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. No, right? no, no, way more, way more. The city game is on, oh, on April right. oh the 9th. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I completely forgot that it is a nine day more rest. More than a week, yeah, actually. Okay. Yeah. In that case, the, the second blessing doesn't really count. He's going to get rest anyway. He'll probably um, be given some kind of permission by the club, I think, to return to Spain. Is this Arlo? This hey, is Arlo. Arlo. Yeah, just a heads up. So uh, my, my kid's <laughs> eating pizza on YouTube right now. So just a heads up, this podcast will be a little bit shorter than usual because it's just me and the kids. 
and uh, they are unpredictable tornadoes. <laughs> Sticking so, his uh, tongue out, man. Don't, Come don't on. Encur- <laughs> and don't encourage him, Lucas. He's a huge <laughs> troll. He will troll me, you, everyone on YouTube. <laughs> All right. So, so, yeah, what I was saying is that uh, he'll probably be given some kind of permission to maybe stay in Brazil for a little longer instead of making his return to Spain uh, immediately after the FIFA break. Makes sense to me, maybe, maybe that he's given some kind of permission to see his family and, and all that, maybe for uh, two or three days. But we'll see about that anyway. He'll be fully rested for the, for the Manchester City game, for sure. In fact, I mean, Rust is a little bit of a concern, maybe, in this regard. He'll, again, he'll be... He'll be without a competitive game in for 25 or 26 days. So maybe it will be a bit of a concern. I'm guessing that he will obviously play for Brazil this FIFA break. I haven't looked at their schedule um, whatsoever. I, I think it's these are, these are it's all a, friendlies. It's a though, couple right? friendlies, yeah. Pretty sure it's, they're, they're both friendlies. These are yeah. all just friendly, so yeah, not really competitive or <clears> anything <throat> in that regard. But yeah, again, maybe... Hopefully, the thing he has to avoid now is, is not staying focused and losing some kind of momentum after this, uh, what will be a fairly long break in the middle of the season for him. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. I think he'll be ready. Well, for, I don't uh, even know. Game. I can't remember. I, I'm pretty sure Brazil, like they don't even have to go far this break because one of those games is at the Bernabeu. Remember? Oh, interesting. Having... And yeah, that's a huge deal because Endrick, uh-huh. if he plays that game, it'll be at the Bernabeu. So he might play at the Bernabeu for the first time and all that. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, I don't think they have to go far regardless. But they have uh, a game at, at, against Spain, at, which is the one at the Bernabeu, and the other one is in England. So yeah, they, they, he doesn't right. have to go to South America. Then you can you can definitely forget all all I said about him being uh, getting permission to kind of stay in Brazil for a little longer. He, I'm guessing he'll stay in Europe for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I also would like to backtrack about my blessing thing in the bit because um, I never really know. I'm not an expert in this, but there's conflicting opinions. Some people say that you don't want that much time in between games because you want rhythm too. So the only especially when you're in that, good form. Yes, definitely. The the so the only blessing really is that he he'll play classico and won't mm-hmm. miss it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now it's highly debatable which game is tougher <laughs> i think you could argue that, <laughs> that the game is actually tougher than barcelona <laughs> but the classico is a big show you know what i mean um uh okay so uh the starting lineup this is now uh a, a couple games at least lucas where we've seen chu and many start over nacho on the back line something that carlos said would never happen if nacho was healthy <laughs> so we have that um nacho did eventually come on when and chu and many shifted to the DM when that happened late. Kamavinga started as a DM. I thought Kamavinga was fantastic today. Yeah. Um, composure on the ball. He had four beautiful tackles at halftime that led the entire game statistically. Uh, led the entire, um, all the players, I should say. He had five by the end of it. I thought he was terrific. Moved between the lines really well. I thought we just had like a lot of good sequences in this game where. Our movement, our buildup was quite good. I love the interchangeability of Cruz uh, and Kamavinga. I like the interchangeability of Rodrigo and uh, Brahim as well between the lines. Their mm. movement was excellent. We got good overloads from Mendy and and uh, and Carvajal, who had a mixed bag but scored an amazing goal. But yeah, where did, what did what did you what did you want to um, I guess talk about in terms of whether it was defense, offense, whatever. I also enjoyed Kamavinga's performance a lot. I think Kamavinga was uh, brilliant defensively with all those tackles, interceptions, anticipated in some uh, key passes for uh, for Osasuna and stole the ball cleanly. So he was brilliant apart from that tackle, late tackle, which earned him the, the yellow card, which again, arguably, it was fairly close to being a, a red card. It was a very uh, a very tough and, and intense and strong tackle. Granted, he obviously knew he was at fault uh, for that. So, I mean, no, nothing nothing wrong there apart from it, from it being late. But yeah, Kamavinga was phenomenal defensively. Uh, I agree. I completely agree with that. Offensively, he didn't much. He didn't do much, but uh, he was so good defensively as a defensive midfielder. You don't often see that. You you don't see that that often. Maybe he's not 
and his IQ in terms of positioning uh, whenever he's playing as a defensive midfielder isn't as great as too many but I think his speed and his uh, and his timing for those tackles is uh, possibly uh, maybe even better than than Chouameni's zone Chouameni is probably more skilled in terms of his positioning but Kamavinga's own tackle tackling ability is, uh, is uh, phenomenal so yeah I completely agree with that I also thought that Chouameni as a center back worked perfectly. Um, Budemir is obviously a very dangerous striker when the ball is in the air, so Ancelotti probably wanted to take care of that. So yeah, a very good defensive uh, performance from Real Madrid, apart from that, uh, from the fact that they obviously conceded two goals, but I thought that they kept things under control for most of the time, apart from, again, those two goals conceded, and obviously that big mistake leading to Osasuna's equalizer. So it's funny because... Um... I used to watch a lot of Mallorca when Kubo was there on loan. And I bring this up because I always noted how much of a threat Budimir was. And of mm -hmm. course, Budimir is now with Osasuna. And Jose and I, we did this a lot before. We don't do it as much now unless it's a big game. But we used to do a lot of preview podcasts the day before. Mm -hmm. And anytime we had to face Budimir, whether it's with Osasuna or previously with Mallorca, I always know, like... Watch out for that guy. He is a behemoth in the box. Aerially, he is a freak. And just don't leave him open. And sometimes even if you don't leave him open and you mark him, he's going to score. I always put him down for a goal in, in any time we play against him. And he got his goal today on a, on a scrambling mess of a defensive set piece. Um, I did want to talk about, I guess, just Osasuna in general. I think they... I mean, I'm not complaining, but the way they played us was perfect for us. Um, yeah. This is the way we want yeah. every opponent to play against us selfishly. Yeah. We don't want them to go into deep blocks and, and and close space. They opened up. They had a really brutal high line. Vinicius fully exposed it. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, and I think that's in part why it was a, such a big game. Uh, a yeah, big a, big game silly from, a big silly from Arrasate to kind of... Uh put and build this game plan for Osasuna. I expected a low block from them. Maybe you can say that that early goal from Vinicius, which came off a big mistake from Osasuna's back line, definitely didn't help uh, Arrasate's plan in this regard. And he was forced to do something, something different than what he was intending to do earlier. But, uh, yeah, definitely, I, it was a bit silly from Arrasate to kind of allow Real Madrid to enjoy this kind of game uh, tonight, uh, today, I should say. But, but yeah, that first goal, maybe, obviously, maybe Osasuna were not expecting to concede that early goal, and that maybe actually forced uh, Arrasate's hand in, in, in playing a different style than what he wanted to do earlier. Um. I also wanted to give a shout out to, I mean, I, I mentioned him in passing, Fede Valverde, the hat trick mm -hmm. assist. So if you look, I mean, all three, he had he had uh, a hand in all three of the, the goals, number two, three, and four. If you look at the way he moved in Real Madrid's second goal, the assist to Carvajal, which shout out to Carvajal, who like moments after a couple bad sequences, including one horrible throw, which nearly cost us a goal. Uh, he took his finish. He reacted to that as if he that was finish like, was ridiculous. Yeah, he was Marco Van Boston in the box. Like the way he reacted was very instinctually like a a lethal striker, like Erling Holland or something. So great Unbelievable, finish. Unbelievable, yeah. Um, the way Sofetti moved in that sequence where he assisted Carvajal, those runs he used to do them a lot, especially like a couple years ago, and they're always so devastating to deal with if you're the defense. Those runs into the half space, he does it from a position where you don't detect it because he's joining from midfield and it just provides you with numerical superiority and those movements just break teams. And so we haven't seen it as much this season because he's been playing in deeper roles this season often, but that completely broke Osasuna and he was fantastic. Any other standouts to you? Brahim, I thought his finish was good. He, it's true that he was kind of invisible during during the whole game. He didn't create many chances and all that. But I thought his finish was uh, should be highlighted in what's been maybe a tough week for him personally. You know, being in the middle of this controversy and all that, he stayed very calm 
in front of the goalkeeper. It was kind of the, the decisive goal for Real Madrid because it built the, the, this two-goal advantage in the score. So yeah, that I thought that finish in particular was very strong. And maybe we can also talk a little bit of, a, a little bit more about Rodrigo, which is sad that you know Real Madrid scored four goals in this game and Rodrigo failed to contribute with a goal or an assist uh, once again. So yeah, maybe uh, yet another kind of disappointing or concerning performance from him. But yeah, you have like the two sides of the uh, of the story with Brahim and, and Rodrigo in this regard. Brahim being in the middle of his own controversy with the whole uh, Morocco and Spain the the vehicle where and staying calm in front of goal with a great finish. Whereas Rodrigo kind of had his own chances, also being in the middle of his own controversy and not, not being able to finish his place and maybe kind of delivering some a bit worrying body language. I don't know if you agree with me. Cameras, uh, by the end of the game, I thought he looked devastated or, or at least very sad in, after, after missing that last, that last chance he got, I thought. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I didn't notice anything uh maybe you saw some things that i didn't admittedly um but i don't know like i thought rodrigo was fine uh the thing is like if you get this rodrigo game in the middle of his scoring streak from earlier this season you wouldn't think too much of it you're like oh he didn't score but he did other things um i thought he got into good positions i mean Vinny set him up a couple times really well Vinny was, I mean, we, we said it, but just to emphasize again, Vinny was incredible today. But I do have to say that Rodrigo, had he dived on that, uh, yeah, on that tackle inside the box, he possibly and should have uh, been awarded a penalty and he probably would have taken it himself. Yes. But he decided to, 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 to finish the play and maybe get a more uh, a, a goal of a play instead of uh, from the penalty spot. So, yeah, I have to give him that in the fact that he pro quite certainly created a penalty kick for himself, but decided not to dive and, and, and finish the play himself. So, yeah. I thought he did well to stay on his feet in that sequence. Um, Why, though? Well, I don't know. It's just like it seems like the right thing to do. Um, like, I don't know. It was an obvious penalty to me. Yeah, well, that's on the ref, I guess, to like acknowledge that. Like, the ref, there was a couple of things the ref. You have did. to fall down, though. That's why I'm not like, and I know there's conflicting takes on this, but I, this is why I personally, I don't get mad at players for embellishing contact and being dramatic, in part right. because that's how I personally play. As uh, long as there's contact, I'm fine with them uh, selling the call. That's what they have to do because it's been proven that unless you fall down, the penalty is not going to be called, man. And that was a clear penalty. There was contact. He tripped him. Like he clearly like impeded his move, uh, his movement inside the box. So all he had to do was sell the call. And again, that it's on the referee. Granted, because Rodrigo shouldn't have to fall down for the referee to call a penalty. But it's clear to me that had he fall, had he fallen down, he he would have probably been given that penalty. Yeah. I agree with you. It's also why I sympathize even with players like Neymar, who like as soon as they stay on their feet and they don't go down, they don't get the call, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't blame players for doing that. Uh, but anyways, commendable either way that he's tried to stay on his yeah, feet and sure. score. Um, sure. But yeah, the ref. I mean, there was a couple of weird ones like that. The other one was the Vinicius penalty, which was clear to me. And there was a similar. Mm. Well, I thought it was the sim, and there was a similar foul on Rodrigo later in the second half. Um, that I don't he, recall that one. He did get called. The ref called that one. And it just told me that if Vinny's was outside the box, it would have been called. Um, but anyway, just to go back to Rodrigo and his chances. So I just thought we could look at how good were his chances that he had. Because he had three shots in this game, five completed yeah. dribbles. And um, shot at the keeper, I think, for all three. If I'm not mistaken, he had one that was this one. This one was tough. It was early on when he was looking up with Vinicius in a little half space. I'm sharing my screen if you're on YouTube. Uh, and then this one, again, set up by Vinicius. Yeah. This one, I think, was right at the keeper. And I think the third one was this one. Yeah, this is the one where he stayed on his feet, right? Exactly, yeah. Let's see the, the biggest, the biggest one, was one was the, the one th uh, on the left side. Yeah, the one. Here's it was Arda a good Goulet's. save. 
<laughs> nice. 0 0.01, 93rd minute, assisted by Lucas Vasquez, left foot shot on the post. That's five goals right there. Our XG was 3.06. I was thinking, like, it's so funny. Like, How much XG on that, uh, Rodrigo, the one on the left, on the left side? 0.33. I think it was, it, I mean, it's pretty big. The other two big ones were Vinny early on and then uh, Fede late on. I don't even remember the uh, Fede one No, the Fede there. is the, 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 the deflection from the crossbar on the Guler, on the Guler shot. Oh, that was Fede? Yeah. yeah, that was Fede. That was Fede. Was he Vasquez. missed it. But my yeah. commentator said Vasquez, but I didn't see the replay. No, nah, it was so. Fede, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, where was I going with all this? It was a point I was going to make. Oh, just that I was looking at Osasuna's mm -hmm. XG and how much they threaten. It's mm -hmm. funny. Like, I saw the starting lineup. I noted Chu and Mani starting over Nacho. And um, I forgot that Chu and Mani was on the field at all until... Nacho came in for him. And I guess that's a good sign. It means like we didn't really, he didn't really have much to do. I noticed Rudiger more. I thought Rudiger put in some amazing challenges. Actually. Yeah, Rudiger is more flashy for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, did Ancelotti speak yet? He, I mean, the, I he don't would, think he did. Well, he usually would go first in this situation because he's the away coach, but yeah, um, I guess not. <clears throat> All right. A um, couple super chats and then we can, uh, Talk about our presenting sponsor. Ancelotti. But... Oh yeah, Ancelotti has said some a few things. Let me just part of translate real quick here. Okay. About Lunin, he's doing really well. We've discovered a goalkeeper who uh, gives us confidence. He's very safe. When Courtois is back, we'll see what happens because he's had a big, big injury, and we have to be cautious. And the same goes for Militao. We're not in a hurry. Lunin is giving us uh, security, safe, safety. Yeah. Uh, about Guler's uh, crossbar uh, chance, only only great talent can see a play like that one. It doesn't matter to me that he didn't score. To us, that's a goal. So Ancelotti echoes your your sentiment in that regard. And yeah, interesting. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Ancelotti, by the way, achieved his 200th victory with for Real Madrid. That's not enough. We're going for 201. And about Vinicius, uh, he could have scored four goals tonight without a problem. It's been extraordinary in every chance he's got. He's done a spectacular uh, performance. So yeah, interesting point about Lunin and, and Courtois, which is the main uh, highlight maybe of the press conference and also of the upcoming weeks, possibly. Um, on Lunin, he was, he made a couple big saves again today. They weren't like point blank, but they were great saves regardless because the mm -hmm. shots that he was facing were great. Um, he is just, I kind of exaggerated it on Twitter just to be not uh, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know for sure you would have found it exaggerating, but I also said I'm exaggerating, but it was a hyperbole tweet, but. He's not only replaced Courtois, like he's become Courtois. Like he's been unreal, man. Like he's been unreal this season. That's why I keep saying, like, the Courtois return is not as urgent as the Militao return to me. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I agree so with that. let's see, man. My my deluded dream, as I pointed out on YouTube during the Champions League live reaction, is that Militao comes back like full force. He's Militao. For that first it's leg, man. If I don't you know. Can, I mean, I what know. are the what are the chances do you think that he'll play? Uh, my kid is just doing funny things right now. That's why I'm laughing. Uh, what are the chances that he can squeeze in a game against Athletic before the first leg? Below fifty percent. A full game starting off I don't the bench. See Maybe some minutes off the bench. I think if even, if, is fine, even but... if he comes in off the bench against Athletic, it's still not going to be enough to, to no. start him in the first leg. It will not be enough for me, definitely. If... Against Haaland in such a tough... It's also the first leg at home, man. Yeah, a single mistake risky. or a single... Yeah, yeah, it's just too risky, man. My I prediction... think in Haaland in that game where a single goal can, can kind of... like It will be catastrophic not winning not winning that game Let, let's be clear now obviously Real Madrid have the potential to beat Manchester City at the Etihad we know this but chances are very very slim so Real Madrid have to win the first leg man 
It's just that it's it's just that simple. They cannot afford to go to the return leg, needing to beat Manchester City at the Etihad, or in a penalty shootout at the Etihad. They they have to win the game at the Bernabeu, and just for that, I think it's just too risky to to give Militao the starting job and, and the task of uh, defending a, a behemoth like like Haaland in that first leg. I I just don't see it. I don't see it. My prediction would be he gets minutes off the bench against Athletic, then minutes off the bench in the first leg. Why? Minutes off the bench in, in the first I. Why would you give him minutes off the bench in the first leg unless it's necessary? Fair point. Fair point. I just imagine that Nacho will come in off the bench if he doesn't start. And in that case, if Militao is ready, then why not? Like I'm not saying start him. But then I will not mess with my center backs in the middle of the first leg unless it's necessary. Obviously, if an injury or a red card or whatever forces your hand, sure, I I I would not change my either one of my center backs in the middle of the first leg. Obviously, in the in the game against Athletic, it's different because you want to get Militao involved and you want to get in to get him in some kind of rhythm. But in the middle of the first leg, I just don't see it. Either. So my counter to that would be. The only reason you even put Militao off the bench against Athletic is so that he is able to, he has some minutes for the City game. If there's no chance of him playing in the first leg against City, then why bring him off the bench against Athletic too? You just wait it out. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I just, I think it's too early, man. I think it's too early for him to have a major impact against Manchester City. I don't know. I don't so know. Let, let me finish my prediction. Which is unlucky, by the way, before you finish, which is unlucky because we're like, we only needed like two extra weeks. That's all we needed <laughs> with him. So, yeah, we'll see. So, let me finish my prediction. He starts the second leg. Okay. He starts the second leg. So, so I work backwards, F FYI. To, in order to start the second leg, you need to have match fitness before. Sure. And you get minutes in the next couple games. But this is just a prediction. I'm not saying right, wrong. I'm just I'm just throwing out there. I think this is what's gonna happen. I mean the alternative really is to start in natural against Haaland, which isn't encouraging. Or I'd rather many. start too many. I know I would start too many as well. But 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 belling him on the field, the only difference. <laughs> Don't you feel though that even though Chuameni has been brilliant as a defense, as a center back, don't you feel like you're kind of uh, getting getting away with it because of the quality of the opposition and that he faces the potential of getting exposed as a center back against a again a giant, a titan as as Haaland? I fear that. Yes, but we at least saw him do it in a high stake game against Leipzig. Sure. And he'll have Rudiger next to him and not Nacho to take the Holland No, you, I, I would trust you. I'm any ahead of Nacho. But my, my main point is the alternative to Militao. The two alternatives to Militao are not that ideal. So maybe oh, you have to roll the that. dice. Maybe I you have to roll that. the dice. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. We're, but I still like we were both on the same page that we would trust two many over Nacho, I think. Yeah, 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 absolutely. If you have and to guarantee that Militao doesn't face any kind of risks, uh, with his recovery or with his yeah, with his uh, ability to stay healthy long term, like if he's clear to play from a, from a medical standpoint, maybe you have to roll the dice because again, it's either Nacho or Tuameni against Haaland. And while I would trust Tuameni ahead of Nacho, it's not ideal to me either. It's not and ideal if, to me. If we didn't have Kamavinga, like it would change the discussion. Like the urgency sure. of needing Tuameni in midfield, Kamavinga mitigates some of that. Now, like, who knows? By the second leg, who's suspended, who's injured? There's so much time left. Maybe that changes again, and you need too many here. You need Kamavinga left back. I don't know what's going to happen, but one game at a time. Um, all right, let's take some Super Chats. Sure. Uh, Mr. Sushi says, hearing of a $70 million offer for Brahim, what are your thoughts? I don't know where you've heard that. I guess you'll keep your, your sources close to your chest, as you should say. If that offer were true, I would sell him. Yeah, that's uh, it's that simple to me. It's uh, I think if Mbappe signs for Madrid this summer, one of Rodrigo and Brahim becomes uh, becomes redundant to me and becomes not needed. And, uh, 
yeah. So I would sell him if that offer is true. Do you think if Real Madrid put out a call right now, public service announcement, Raheem Diaz is available for $70 million. You don't think they would get an offer like that? No. In this market, have you seen, seen some it. of these players and what they're going for? I think I think you would get it. I don't see it. I don't see it. I think that's too much. I think that's too much for a player who has featured three, four times in the starting lineup for Madrid. Many, and many, many, many more to come. And he's been wildly impactful. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm the biggest Brian fan on the whole side, possibly. I know. So, but uh, I don't see that value exceeding 50 right now. Mr. Sushi says he heard it from the ESPN commentator. Okay, okay. Again, I don't, I don't see his value being north of uh, 50 million. And this all, and by the way, this is kind of unfair because this has to do with marketing and, 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 and kind of narrative as well. Is Brian worth more than some of the players going for 60 or 70 million to the Premier League? Quite possibly. But he doesn't have th this narrative behind him and this kind of marketing power of house behind him. He's kind of invisible uh, being a uh, reserve in, in Real Madrid. So, yeah. Uh, in verse, no commentary says, oh, well, nothing. Just a new new YouTube member. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks, you're, man. Welcome. You've gotten a ton of bonus content and you're getting a ton of bonus content. Congratulations and welcome to the family. If you want to join in verse, no commentary and his legendary status and, uh, you know, hang out with us on Zoom, ask us questions, on me, your mic, turn on your camera, talk to us, then become a member. All Don't right. be disappointed, by the way, with the upcoming two weeks, because during the FIFA break, we will still produce content. But obviously, you cannot expect that content to be as exciting as the as, as the content that is coming after the during the, the Champions League tie or during Liga games, really. It's just, it will be obviously a little bit more uh, news based and news driven content rather than, again, match content, tactical analysis and all that. So, yeah. Counter argument, it's going to be even better for members because if we have less to talk about, it's more opportunity for them to talk to us on Zoom. Sure, and, and propose some interesting questions, yeah. Uh, Dean Portman says, loves the show. Fam, Real Madrid and Colorado Avalanche, my two favorite teams in the world. Okay. Shout okay. out to Patrick Roy. You have, One of the you have any ever. You have any love for the Nuggets, being an, sure. an Avalanche fan? I'm let sure. us know, let us know. Uh all right, we're going to take a quick break. And by break, I mean, we're not going to head to commercial or anything like that. You stick around. But we do want to give a shout out to our presenting sponsor, Manscaped. Listeners, you guys can go to manscaped.com, use code Managing Madrid to get 20% off, off and free shipping. As we know, the best performers on the field always manscape before the game. We always manscape before the podcast. No, uh, no exceptions. And as we like to do, after every Real Madrid game, we give out a Manscaped Man of the Match award. It goes to the player who Manscaped the most and therefore performed the best on the field. So, Lucas, please present our Manscaped Man of the Match award today. Who is it going to? Vinicius Jr. clearly Manscaped uh, ahead of this game. He not only scored two goals, he was close to scoring a hat-trick. In, in this one, carried Real Madrid to, to victory today quite possibly proving his his good form. So definitely great performance from Vinicius and clear and obvious uh, Manscaped man of the match for me. Listeners, if you want to perform like Vinicius Jr. and dominate your Sunday league, go to manscaped.com and use code Managing Madrid for 20% off and free shipping. That's manscaped.com. Use code Managing Madrid for 20% off and free shipping. Awesome. Um, all right, cool, Lucas. Uh, what did we miss? Anything? Not for me. I may maybe give a little bit more praise to Fede Valverde. I've been seeing on you gave him his flowers uh, on yeah. uh, earlier in the show, but I think he he was possibly if it weren't for Vinicius's two goals and and the other chances he had, I would possibly have given had given the the manscaped man of the match uh, to him. So yeah. You're on mute, Kian. 
All right, rookie you error, go. my apologies. So just sharing my screen as I like to do and checking out Mark Stat Spot on Twitter. Um, expected goals, we went over already. Expected threat, slightly in our favor. Uh, a lot of possession. And uh, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap it up soon. My kids uh, also. These are kids doing... are naughty, man. You have you have oh. to to put him to put them to Space Jam or something. Oh, dude, <laughs> you, you so remember I told you they're big trolls. They're <laughs> they were doing Gangnam Style in front of me and and laughing at me, trying to get me to laugh <laughs> on the podcast. Um, so uh, this is very common stuff. Tony Cruz, best progressor via pass via carry. Brahim Diaz also very good in that regard as well so we pretty much dominated this game the eye test already told us that but yeah it's it's pretty clear for all to see yep yeah um okay cool uh i'll just gonna do a quick run through of my notes so lucas if you have anything now is the now is the time or forever hold your peace not for me go ahead um we went over the goals i think Bra i mean i don't know if we mentioned brahim's goal but he took it beautifully very composed finish uh, we spoke about Kamavinga, Guler Madness at the end. We spoke about we spoke about Kamavinga, Rudiger, Carvajal, Lunin, Rodrigo, um, Fede, Vinny. I think we got it all, bro. Yeah. Uh, we even squeezed in some Manchester City talk. So yeah. Another quote here from Ancelotti about the Vinicius um, Vinicius's attitude. Maybe he said the pressure he has on or the pressure he faces. Let me try to rephrase this. It's in Spanish, so I'm trying to find the best translation so that Ancelotti is not misquoted or anything. The pressure he has or that he's facing in hostile environments, he has to control that a little bit more or a little bit better or a little bit more efficiently. That's what he said. After praising him, by the way. So he, in no way he's... Uh, <laughs> in no way he's uh, kind of uh, displeased or anger uh, with Vinicius. But he just mentioned that. Can I give you my... My next delusional take of optimistic right. delusion. I think because him and Walker, Kyle Walker, are good. Oh. Generally in the Champions League too, it's a little bit more tame. Although against Leipzig, he did have his moment of mm. regret. I think against City, he'll escape. That's my delusional optimistic take. For hopefully. Today. Hopefully. Definitely. Uh, we did have a super chat that we missed. Um, All right. Anthony Tharp, our main man, Anthony. Fede Valverde deserves all the plaudits. His consistency while playing every single match has been key to our success this season. Another great yeah. Fede game. Couldn't agree yeah. more, Anthony. If he performs yeah. well, I mean, it's just an added engine um, yeah. that gives us so much balance on the field. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Lucas, before uh, my kids turn down the entire, <laughs> just tear down the entire podcast production, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um you and I, are we going to be back for El Dia Después on Monday or no? On Monday, it will be tough It will be tough for me on Monday. I don't know if you can do eight or something like that. What's your... We'll figure it out off there. All right. All right. We'll figure it out. Uh, listeners, go to patreon.com slash managing Madrid for a ton of bonus content coming up. And uh, if you don't have Patreon in your country for whatever reason, you can join us on YouTube memberships by hitting join on YouTube. And also... Uh, we got two special guests coming on the podcast this week, which uh, if you remember, you already know who they are. All right, guys. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for bearing with the noise. And we'll catch you guys later. Peace out.